I think it is something that uh, is of importance to all of us because uh, it will deal with uh, a lot of electronic appliances and devices that we're using on an everyday basis. Mobile phones, laptop computers, um, Bluetooth devices, you name it. Um, we're dealing here with the electromagnetic spectrum, um, so basically it's all photons, but in, in different frequency ranges. And what uh, we are normally not necessarily sort of consciously aware on an everyday basis is that everything ranging from, let's say, cosmic uh, radiation, X-ray, uh, as used in, in, in medicine, via the very small spectrum of the visible light, which ranges from about 380 nanometers to 780 nanometers, down to all the radio frequencies that we use for radio and television, uh, down to also the electrical currents that are uh, fluctuating in our um, power lines. Um, this is all more or less the same thing. Uh, of course, in the power lines, it's electrons that are moving, but they are radiating electric fields, magnetic fields, electromagnetic fields. Every power line is also an antenna. So, um, what makes, um, let's say, the influence of extraterrestrial, if I may say so, um, electromagnetic fields that come from the sun, for example, um, more, let's say, bearable to us is the fact that not all the radiation that comes from the universe will be transmitted to the surface of the Earth. There are only two windows where actually um, radiation does not get attenuated like um, so much up to 100% for fortunately most, most of what, what comes in from the outside. There are these two windows, which is basically the visible, the for us visible light, and uh, yes, also in the radio frequency range, uh, there's a good chance of propagation of uh, these waves through the atmosphere without being attenuated too much. So the devices that are being used in all these frequency ranges, <clears throat> um, Yes, range from, as mentioned before, computers, cellular phones, microwave ovens, X-ray, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the one big difference, also in, in medical terms, let's say, is that um, electromagnetic radiation above a certain wavelength, uh, by physics, has uh, ionizing powers. That has to do with the energy level of the of the photons involved. And uh, I have just contrasted down here that, uh, for example, uh, in, in the infrared light, which is still relatively mild, I mean, of course, you can also get burned if the wattage of an infrared lamp gets uh, put up uh, too much, but uh, the radiation itself is of much lower energy. It's only about 0 0.01 electron volts, while X-ray photons have 10,000 electron volts which makes it quite clear that the danger involved there is substantially higher. And, um, yeah, for the sake of time, I will go through a little bit more quickly. So basically, this is a big distinction. And what I want to point out at this point is that um, here, uh, at the range of the visible light, the, the blue light, which I'm going to mention afterwards, is of course much more towards the direction of the ultraviolet light than the infrared, which is uh, comparably harmless, so to speak. Um, so for those who are more interested in a few details on the frequency ranges that we are actually surrounding ourselves as due to the electronic devices that we're using on an everyday basis, a quick overview here. Uh, these are the radio frequencies for radio television, and then we go up to the to the megahertz and gigahertz range, up to five gigahertz, in fact, when we're using uh, these uh, wireless LAN devices. They are splayed out in several frequency ranges. Uh, 5G, for example, tries to fit in somewhere. The exact frequency ranges also will also depend on the country that we're talking about, but this is uh, concerning Austria. And the decked phones that are still in widespread use at home uh, lie around here at 1.8 uh, gigahertz, so 1,800 megahertz. Um, why is this of interest? Because 
all these devices are, as I've mentioned before, are radiating electromagnetic fields. In the course of the next slides that we will see, I will also show the electric fields and the magnetic fields. Not going into details here, what are the differences, but I have listed here essentially which um, appliances are concerned and, and uh, producing these fields. And yes, I found extremely useful this um, electrosmog meter testing device by Eric Hill, which uh, is quite cheap if somebody is curious to test his ho own home environment. I think this is pretty affordable and um, not getting any percentage from them. Uh, so in order to let you understand what you, you're going to see here, uh, I have to do a quick run through um, on, on the basic things. So the radio frequencies uh, this device can measure lie in the frequency range of from 1 megahertz to 10 gigahertz, so covers all uh, wireless LAN applications, for example, very well, including cellular phones, etc. Uh, while for the electric field and magnetic field measurements, we have a lower uh, frequency band uh, starting at almost 0, 5 hertz to uh, 3.5 gigahertz and um, the range that can be measured uh, goes up to 1800 milliwatts per square meter so this would basically be, be 1.8 watts per square meter for the radio frequencies meaning cellular phones, decked phones etc and, and um, uh, wireless LAN appliances while the electric fields can be measured up to almost 2000 volts per meter of field strength and the magnetic fields, uh, depending on, on uh, whether you want to measure it in milligauss or microtesla, it goes up to about 100 microtesla. This is the measure that I will use for the photographies that you will see. Um, now the classification in terms of what are the, what is good, what is acceptable, and what might be dangerous for humans in terms of signal or field strength. Um, these are the figures that, that count. Um, so, watch out for the reds on the photos to make it easy. Whenever you see something red, then this is supposedly not good for the human body. So first of all, of course, a cellular phone, which we're using on the everyday basis. Um, you see that we are here in the range of about 10 milliwatts per square meter. So this already gives you a red reading on the measurement device. The decked phone is actually much more heavy on your head, probably, um, giving values that are 10 times more than the regular cellular phone. Of course, with cellular phones, you, it, it needs to be said that how much the cellular phone radiates will, of course, depend on the signal strength and connection to the next station, so to speak. Uh, mobile phone stations are in the cities usually every at least kilometer or so from each other. Uh, so depending on where you are, if you're inside a house, then of course your mobile phone will have to go to a higher power wattage in order to still be able to get through the walls and get to the next cellular station. Um, I was also curious to see how much actually the Bluetooth earbuds radiate because um, they're very widespread and uh, people presume that they're more, much more healthy, let's say, than uh, having the cellular phone next to your ear. And, and yes, it is true, they are radiating less, but I was really surprised to find that it's not so much less, actually, because you can see here that it is still around 3 to 5 microwatts per square meter, and uh, with peaks up to 13 milliwatts, which the peaks have been stored here. And um, so the peaks are actually in the same magnitude as, the cell, as what the cellular phone would need or radiate in terms of uh, power. And uh, of course, I was also curious to see what the wireless LAN router at home would do. So here, this, according to the reading, this is, uh, this is on the slight radiation. But what kind of made me reflect a little bit on this is that when you read the user manual of this device, the manufacturer says, uh, place this at least two meters from your working place. Um, so if these five milliwatts per square meter in the very close vicinity of this device, this will drop off 
to a much lower level when I get away with the measurement device. So just in comparison with what the cellular phone does close to your head, I think this should make you reflect of how healthy can it be to use the cellular phone close to your head if these five milliwatts so close to the Wi-Fi device is already sort of considered not appropriate by the manufacturer. Okay, another thing that is uh, more important to all people in the entertainment industry, this is a belt pack transmitter, uh, which is in use with the head headsets that we find so commonly. Um, usually in Austria at least and Germany, these devices can be driven with either 10 milliwatts of power or 50 milliwatts of power. Um, this one for the measurement is driven with 50 milliwatts of power and I think this reflects very well with the reading on the measurement device because essentially we are just uh, the antenna is an omnidirectional antenna of course and so at best we can measure sort of half sphere of what the antenna radiates so this reading of about 25 milliwatts is, is a is perfect proof that this uh, belt brick transmitter is working correctly which I'm very glad of because it's one of our, my department, and <laughs> I will be happy to use it next time on the show. Um, but I was also curious to see, does it only radiate electromagnetic frequencies, or does it also have a, a relevant electric field and magnetic field? And yes, indeed it has. Uh, the 37 volts per meter are maybe not that much um, scaring, but the magnetic field of 10 microtesla sorry, uh, 1, 1 1.27 microteslas uh, is already considered um, severe by the measurement device. Laptops. Measured in this case, of course, not the radio frequency range, but the electrical field. Considering that we have this, as the name indicates, often on our laptop, on our lap, sitting there, uh, I think these readings of above 100 volts per meter um, are to be considered if it's a good idea to have this as an uh, hour-long uh, work practice. And um, of course, no surprise that the power supply to the laptop is much worse in close vicinity because here we're going to more than 10 times what the laptop radiates. Light appliances um, are a similar thing, at least in close vicinity. Uh, neon lights, for example, have these very nasty, um, as we call them in German, Starter, uh, who are doing really nasty uh, uh, fields around them. And uh, as you can see, there is almost 2,000 volts per meter electrical field around. In comparison, the traditional light bulb uh, gives you uh, much, much less. And then, of course, I was curious to see how the situation in bed would be. How calm is it there? Um, we have only 11 volts per meter, so this is considered good. Going back to other two examples and looking at the magnetic fields that they radiate, again there the neon light source is not doing so well. It's, it's considered a severe um, pollution, let's say. And the same, of course, goes for the power supply of the laptop. Um, okay, quickly to move on. Um, Again, some measurements in the vicinity of the laptop concerning magnetic fields, also not really on the green side. And now I want, if, if I'm being allowed, I would like to share a few thoughts on the light sources. Um, probably going to skip this. All the medical doctors in the room will be totally aware of the importance of the the importance of having the full spectrum of normal daylight available for our bodies. Because it uh, is so fundamental to the creation of vitamin D, for example. It controls uh, hormonal processes in the body. So I think this one phrase here, the light entering the eyes controls the cybernetics of the human body through color and brightness. UVB radiation controls the calcium, carbohydrate, and phosphorus metabolism in the body. So 
The sunlight is therefore essential to all of us, regardless of age. Um, this shows for mid-Europe the vitamin D synthesis that goes on in our body, which is sufficient uh, starting from about April and uh, until October more or less, and then in the winter months we might have to help with some additional medication. Um, of course, when we talk about light, there with an overexposure of light, which can easily happen in the theater environment, for example, we have to be very careful. And I just want to run through quickly some of the major medical problems that can occur if people are exposed to too high amounts of infrared or ultraviolet light. So you can have corneal inflammation, photoconjunctivitis, even a cataract, or macular degeneration of the retina. So that's why when there are light rehearsals in the theater, the, let's say, light talent, because usually it's not the actors themselves that will stand there for hours patiently, uh, light talent will have um, sunglasses on that are appropriate for the job because they're standing there for hours and exposed to various light sources with uh, differing degrees of ultraviolet uh, in their spectrum, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one very interesting thing uh, is this uh, circadian receptor that was discovered only in, t in 2001 by two scientists independently. And uh, it was made clear back then how our human uh, autonomic nervous system depends largely, the well functioning of this depends largely on the, this circadian light receptor. So hence the importance of reducing the blue light part of um, displays in laptop computers and smartphones became clear and uh, the more modern appliances usually have some kind of filter that can be activated in order to get the blue light part out. The problem with the blue light part is essentially that the sensitivity of the human eye is according to the curve that you can see here. So light components that are towards uh, the blue light side of the sensitivity of the human eye will not be interpreted correctly, will not even be seen correctly by our internal light receptors. Essentially, this means that the, the pupil will not close enough to reduce uh, the strength of this blue light part um, in order to not cause harm to the retina. And that, that is essentially the main problem that we have there, apart from the fact that blue light stimulates our uh, vegetativus nervous system, as we say. So, um, how the industry handles these uh, LED lights is essentially, it's, it's a bit similar to what uh, neon light bulbs were doing. The energy gets transmitted here in this spectrum around 460, 70 nanometers and indirectly triggers uh, luminescence effects of other materials like uh, in, in a phosphorescence, phosphorescence effect. And I have taken a look now at um, the spectra that you can actually get from uh, LED lights in that case. So, there are some differences, like the daylight type, for example, um, allows for a much higher radiation in the, in the range of the blue light, while the warm white type uh, obviously tries to reduce the blue light uh, component of it. And as we can see here through these figures, we have um, the red component in this warm white type is, makes up for 46% of the whole. The green light component is 43% and the rest, only like 10%, is reserved for the blue light. So this is much better and nicer light for us, I would, I would argue. Just a quick comparison with which what used to be uh, the technology with neon lights. Uh, here, 
you see there is a vast difference. Neon light essentially uh, has very small peaks with very high level and not much in between. That is the reason why neon light very often is not very satisfactory for the human eye. The pulsed light emission characteristic of LED lights. When I went through the data sheets of two different LED light appliances, um, I came across two parameters that were new to me. Uh, the one is a flicker metric and the other one is the stroboscopic effect metric. Uh, as you can see on this slide, the, for the first appliance, LED light number one, both values are around 1.0 uh, or 0 0.9 respectively. While for the other LED light appliance, one of them being uh, of the daylight type and the other one is warm white, the same parameters uh, are shown here to be just 0.1. So I think that's quite surprising because that would mean to me that these two devices must behave quite differently in terms of uh, flicker or stroboscopic effect. Unfortunately, I can't tell you more uh, on, on this point at the moment because uh, I'm, I don't have any additional knowledge about the measurement procedure or what these values uh, indicate if, if 1.0 is, is a good value or if 0.1 is a good value. So uh, more research needs to be done on that from my side. Now I'm going to show you a, a video uh, in which we can see the flickering behavior of, uh, let's say, a standard uh, LED light bulb. So visible here is essentially uh, my experience in a, we were, we were on vacation, this is in a hotel room. And you can see quite clearly the flickering of the light there. This is, of course, uh, this video was done by me using my smartphone, uh, put to the professional mode, video recorder professional mode, and adjusting the exposure time to uh, thousands of seconds. So, of course, I'm deviating from the standard settings in order to achieve this qu quite visible. Let's say, uh, yes, this is a kind of uh, stroboscopic effect that we get here by playing the flickering uh, characteristic of the LED lights against uh, a different sort of sampling uh, frequency of the camera. And I have got another example here which shows the same, a similar situation for a digital mixing desk, which um, uses signal uh, LEDs uh, on, on the surface uh, and also little screens uh, to display the channel names. And I'm doing the same thing here. I'm sliding the fader of the single frame exposure time on the camera in video pro mode and you see what happens that you get very nasty flickering um, of both the computer screen to the left which is built into the mixing console as well as all the visual signaling elements of the disc all the lights and signal lamps and I'm gonna, gonna show this video again because I also want to point out uh, the difference between the computer screen on the left, which as I've said is built into the board, into the mixing console, while the computer screen on the right is uh, a regular computer screen not attached to the console and you can see that the computer screen stays stable, which might have to do with the quality of the computer screen or with the uh, rebuild rate of the display there. So in any case, uh, this is a quite visible difference in how these electronic uh, displays uh, behave when uh, being exposed to, to the camera. As we have just seen, LEDs are also used for signaling purposes in man-machine interfaces. Flickering characteristic may create disturbance in operators, especially if continuous work over many hours 
without taking the recommended breaks is performed, which is unfortunately quite common in the entertainment industry and theater environment. There is actually a position paper on flickering and stroboscopic effect issued by Lighting Europe, in which it is stated that different terms exist to describe artifacts that may be perceived by humans due to the fact that the light output of a lighting product varies with time. The general term for this is temporal light artifacts, TLA, which includes two well-known phenomena, flicker and stroboscopic effect. Formally, temporal light artifacts are described as undesired effects in the visual perception of an observer within an environment. The term flicker refers to unacceptable light variation that is directly perceived by an average or normal observer. Stroboscopic effect is an effect which may become visible for an average observer when a moving or rotating object is illuminated. Lighting products that exhibit flicker or stroboscopic effect are considered not good quality lighting. Temporal light artifacts are not just annoying to humans but might also have health impacts. See Annex A. Currently, modulation depth, MD, and flicker index, FI, are often used to quantify flicker or stroboscopic effect. It has been shown that both metrics are not able to objectively score the level of flicker or stroboscopic effect as actually perceived by humans. Instead of MD and FI, for flicker, a widely applied and IEC standardized metric exists, the short-term flicker severity, PSTLM. For the objective assessment of stroboscopic effect, the stroboscopic visibility measure, SVM, is available. Adverse effects on optical systems such as high-speed cameras, smartphones, barcode scanners, etc. are not considered in this paper. And if we read further down in Annex A concerning the effects on humans, it is stated, the effects considered in this position paper are limited to flicker and stroboscopic effects perceived by humans due to the modulation in the light output of the lighting equipment. During the past years, the scientific committees, IEEE, PAR 1789 and EC SENAR, have assessed the potential health, performance and safety related effects resulting from flicker and stroboscopic effects. Possible adverse effects on human health are migraine and aggravation of autistic behavior and even photosensitive epileptic seizure under extreme conditions, for example, flashlights. Performance and safety related implications are the incorrect perception of the motion of an object and distraction, which may be unacceptable in working environments with machinery. As a consequence, within Europe, the European Commission has issued mandate M519EN, in which the need for new or enhanced performance standards for flicker and stroboscopic effects has been identified as one of the key areas of concern. Individual people have a different sensitivity for flicker and stroboscopic effect. There are some experiments and studies done showing no effect of age. The literature that this refers to is uh, G. Pertz et al. Modeling the visibility of the stroboscopic effect occurring in temporally modulated light systems, which has been published in Lighting Research and Technology Online, May 13, 2014. Therefore, we currently assume that sensitivity to temporal light artifacts is age independent. Now, at the end of the paper, um, there is also information given on who is actually Lighting, who stands for Lighting Europe. Lighting Europe is an industry association of 33 European lighting manufacturers, national associations and companies producing materials. Lighting Europe members present over 1,000 European companies, a majority of which are SMEs a total workforce of over 100,000 people in Europe and an annual turnover estimated to exceed 20 billion euros. Lighting Europe is dedicated to promoting efficient lighting practices for the benefit of the global environment, human comfort and the health and safety of consumers. Now, have we really gained in human comfort and the health and safety of consumers when advancing the technology from the traditional light bulb uh, to LED lights. I think this is 
a very valid question uh, as we have just examined the flickering qualities of the new LED lights which apparently are just being accepted by the lighting industry as a whole but I really wonder if this has just to be accepted just as well by the broad public. I think that in terms of quality of light, we were probably better off with the traditional light bulb, which gives continuous light and not flickering or stroboscopic effect. Now we come to the summary. M mobile electronic devices such as laptop computers, mobile phones, decked phones, but also Bluetooth devices are surrounded by electric, magnetic and electromagnetic radiation of non-negligible strength. The amount of radiation can, in close vicinity, combined with long-term exposure, be harmful to humans, according to the classification of the ER02 measurement device. Also, electromagnetic fields in the frequency range of visible light bear several dangers, not only due to the composition of the color spectrum, see the blue light percentage of the light appliance, but also due to the flickering characteristic of modern light equipment using LED technology. Possible effects there are environmental disorientation, dizziness, migraine, to photosensitive epileptic seizure. I come to the conclusions. It seems highly advisable to review one's common work practice situation. For example, does the laptop computer really have to stay on your lap uh, for hours? Is that safe and healthy? Or maybe we could use wired headsets instead of the Bluetooth headset, which has shown to also radiate relevant amounts of electromagnetic fields. Has the industry managed to convince us to trade in our previous, in terms of production, low-tech lighting technology, meaning the traditional light bulb, for new technologies, meaning the energy-saving lamp and LED lights at home, in public and in professional theater environments, which are only presumably environmental friendly and also potentially harmful for humans? My clear answer is yes. The light industry has apparently done a terrific job in convincing us to switch to these new technologies. But I think we have seriously hampered the quality side of things going that way. Personal conclusion, considering the fact that the human nervous system is fundamentally based on the creation and propagation of electrical signals along the bodily nerves, it may seem rather daring to expose ourselves to relevant amounts of EM radiation on a constant daily basis without previously conducting large-scale long-term experiments on the potential side effects. But maybe the truth is that we find ourselves already in such a large-scale long-term experiment without being really aware of it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.